Hello. Welcome to everybody out there. My name is Neil Boyd. I'm coming to you live from AIE Sydney, Academy of Interactive Entertainment. And this afternoon we have what we'd like to call a power hour of sessions run by some game industry veterans. I think combined we have, we have hundreds of years of experience for you today uh, to share and give you some insights into and tips and tricks uh, for your game development teams that you're leading in the STEM Games Challenge. So to start off with, we've got um, someone that has been known as the, the father of the games industry in Australia and is also the uh, CEO of the Academy of Interactive Entertainment, Mr John DeMargariti. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to John. Hi everyone. Um, I've just been asked to do a small talk about about me and um, also just about the journey um, that I've actually gone through in making video games as well as running educational institutions. And I understand that games can be a, an issue for some folks who are not very technically minded or don't really understand it from a technical point of view. So I thought I'd take you through my journey, particularly in my younger years when I was um, in year 10 uh, or even year, year 5 all the way to year 12. So I thought I thought I'd better talk a bit about myself and give you a bit of a sense of my journey so that you can um, and also just advise some of the future opportunities. So first of all, I thought I'd share some of the achievements that I've done and that give you a perspective of what actually can happen if good teachers can actually um, uh, focus on the journey of a young young person, um, particularly my formative years. Um, so that's that's basically what we're doing. So on that slide that you're seeing there, um, I've created a number of organisations. Um, the first one was really Microforta, which is a game studio that I uh, created with some university friends back in 1985 while I was studying at New South Wales, my electrical engineering degree. And I created this company through through the friends that I actually met in year 11 and 12 in Canberra. Now, during that time, we made video games. We made sure we chose lectures that didn't start earlier than 11 a.m. so we could actually work all night. But it wasn't very fashionable. There were no computer stores where you can play, you know, buy uh, computer games. And so it was pretty tough. Uh, one of the great achievements with Microforta was making a, a game called Fallout Tactics, which was one of the most successful games. Now, around 2012, I created another company called Big World. The, the big idea that was there that I had was that there was a way of connecting computers together, which now is known as massively multiplayer games. And I patented that idea, and I was able to arrange venture capital. And I created this platform, which was licensed to many technology companies around the world. The most notable ones is a company called NetEase, which at, at some point in time I had about 40% of the Chinese market. Another co a company called Wargaming, which were the creators of a game called World of Tanks. Now I sold that business in 2012, and um, and um, you know it made a lot of the the programmers and a lot of the folks um, uh, you know considerably well off. Um, some of them also became multimillionaires. So it was a quite a successful um, project. And Wargaming itself grew from a company of uh, 50 odd people to I believe it's got over 4,000 people, uh, literally in about a four year four year period. So that was a you know, phenomenal success in creating that platform. And now during the Micro Four Day journey, uh, we needed talent. And one of the issues we had was we couldn't find talent. So in '96, we um, we created the yeah, AIA, yeah, not-for-profit institution, to solve the problems that we had at Microforte, as well as the industry partners. And then along the way, in '99, um, also created an entity called the Game Developers Association of Australia. And that was really to help coordinate, you know, the industry as a whole, and and, and really lobby government for potential funding and uh, tax breaks that our industry could could obtain. So. But how did this all start? And I still the journey still continues. But how did this all start? Well, it started in primary school. Um, my er early entrepreneurial activity was not very supported in primary school, obviously. Um, but later on, as I moved into high school, uh, I was given access to the, um, the school's only computer, and we're talking in 77, 78 here. And um, and by you know a meaningful you know a teacher that really focused on on learning outcomes, and that really led me down the track where in 79 and 1980. I was attending year 11 and 12, I had a very good supportive group of teachers and that was a formative years for me. And the years that, that what they allowed me to do was to experiment in making uh, a video, uh, you know, a Super 8 film and I was able to give it, I was given access to the school hall, I was given access to the theatre, a, a little room and I spent pretty much those two years with 60, 70, 80 other students along the way creating a special effects film. Now, you know, the film didn't achieve any notoriety, but the main thing was it led me really to experiment with computers, and in particularly, I was trying to solve some problems. And that later on, as I was attending university, I caught up with my university um, in my year 11 and 12 mates, and 
through that process, I got, got interested in computer games, the whole aspect of playing around with computers. So really, the, the, is the formative years um, are really the most important. Later on, as I was an adult, and I was able to you know, figure things out for myself, it actually got a lot easier to, to do things. But with that initial break, you know, it wouldn't have happened. And it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have occurred. So, you know, the challenge for, for, for you know, with all this is really to, to um, work with you know, young folks, you know, as, as young as 10, and giving them opportunities, not necessarily understanding what they're doing, because there's some new things that are happening like VR and you know, virtual reality and augmented reality and some new cool things that are going on. And you may or may not fully understand what these 10 year olds, 12 year olds, 15 year olds are actually doing. But the key thing is to enable them, to encourage them. You know, one of the things that was really great was you know, we did that 30 year reunion at, at, at Hawker College where I went. And it was great to see some of these old teachers and talk about these stories. And they had photographs of that period of time. And it was actually fantastic. I was able to you know, come back with my, my university friends that we did really you know, successful. Then we were able to create a, a foundation, a mechanism to fund that school for the next 10 years. So it was also financially rewarding for our, uh, our high school. So the key thing I'd like to really say is that the industry itself has got a lot of potential. It's on constant growth mode. We've never seen a situation where the revenues have actually dropped. The only time that happened was in 1983 when the industry was formed. It was, it was about $3 billion. And in 1985, two years later, it dropped to $100 million in, in, in the world globally. So it really had this hammering effect. And I started the business in 1985 as it was coming out of that massive recession. Since then, the industry, the video game industry, has never really looked back. So anything really is, is possible. But, um, and you may not fully understand what students are doing these days and some of the, the technologies they're playing with. But you've really got to try and actually support them uh, enable them to, to, to experiment and to, to really encourage their curiosity in various areas because they, you know, if you don't know, they actually certainly don't know what their future will be. They, they will create their own future. And this is why I think STEM is really, really important and that's why the Academy you know, is a strong supporter of the whole program. Yeah, so that's basically my, 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 um, yeah, my, my thoughts on the whole matter. Thanks a lot, John. That's fantastic. We've got Four more sessions. So our next session uh, is going to be on game design, but just so you're aware of what's coming up. So Jennifer Sherl is going to be talking about game design um, and facilitating design in teams. We've got um, a coding for collaboration. So Conan Burke um, is talking about how to get your teams working together and some simple tricks and techniques you can get programmers troubleshooting together. Um, we've got a game art session coming up, Pixels Tell a Thousand Words. And then we have our, what does a game sound like? So something that often gets left to the very end of a game development session, um, sound. And it's something that you may not be thinking about at the moment. There's a couple of things that uh, Dale Ward is actually going to be sharing with you. While we're running these sessions, if you have any comments or questions or feedback for us while you're going, we have a chat room set up. And it's aie.edu.au forward slash chat room. And it's just been set up for this event. So if you do have any feedback, um, please go there, ask the questions. Um, we have a couple of people online that are just monitoring that and watching that and seeing what's happening. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Sherl, who's had been involved in the development of eight game titles, currently working on a very cool game that you might want to look up at some point down the track called Objects in Space, which she's working on with Flat Earth Games. So I'll hand over to Jennifer now. Hello. <laughs> I hope you can hear and see me. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Neil. So as, um, as said, my name is Jenny, and I'm a game design teacher at AIE. I uh, currently work on a game called Objects in Space, and I have worked in the industry for about six years now. And I'd like to go over a few things that uh, can be useful for you when you're teaching students when you want to try an interesting and, and creative approach. So. Um, just out of experience, I'd like to very quickly tell you what game designers do because I get this question a lot. It's a bit of an arbitrary and weird thing to talk about. So um, game designers overall are responsible for the systems of a game, the mechanics that make a game experience a game experience. Everything it has to do with how the player feels whenever they jump into a game. So we are responsible for how t things tie into each other. Um, that makes us a really weird field, and game designers have very specific skills. So we have to work with 
a whole bunch of different people from different backgrounds. We have to work with musicians and with artists and with programmers, and they all have um, all kinds of different specifics. So we, while working with all these different people, have to make sure the vision of the product stays on track. And at the same time, we have to work creatively while being under a lot of pressure from deadlines. That is quite interesting, because when students come to our school, they need to learn two things more than anything else. And that is communication and collaboration. Um, mainly collaboration, because the best products that we know and the best inventions that we know out there are done by teams and not by individuals. We have this culture of attaching um, great inventions and, and products to single people, which is actually kind of not true. If you look at uh, Steve Jobs or Apple or anything like that, um, teams develop these amazing products. And um, that is mainly creative teams, creative thinkers. So what I'd like to talk about today is how to facilitate creative thinking and collaboration in teams. Because creative and collaborative teams face a really strange uh, challenge. They have to learn to channel creative work while meeting deadlines and being under a lot of pressure. And we tend to view creativity as a state that we can't really control, something that just comes to us when we're lucky. And we sometimes attach creativity to only specific areas, like, for example, art or anything artistic. Um, well, that's actually not true. Programmers and more technical jobs in, in STEM or anywhere else have a great degree of creativity attached to them, too. So um, what I'd also like to talk about is how we believe that we can't learn these things, that creativity is something that people either have or don't. But actually, you can learn how to be a creative person, and you can learn how to get better at it over time when you need it. So um, while trying to answer this question with my students and to facilitate better teams during my career, I was researching a lot of things about um, what the number one reason is for teams and groups to hold back creativity. And I'd really like to mention a, a great guy called Tim Brown. He's the CEO of innovation and design firm IDEO. Uh, if you have a chance, just look him up. He does great talks about play and uh, creativity. And he gives talks about this, and he gives people the challenge um, to uh, give them 30 seconds to draw the person next to them. And interestingly, whenever he does this exercise with adults specifically, what happens is that afterwards it's kind of awkward. People are always like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, and they, they show each other the paintings and they apologize a lot for what they did. Well, as soon as you do it with kids, kids are very happy with showing each other their, um, their work and their masterpieces and their sort of exchange and fun and playfulness. So especially among adults and um, people, you know, young, young folks growing out of, out of high school, there is a fear of judgment from our peers that holds us back with our creativity. It's the feeling of not having my voice being heard in a team. And that's the number one reason for holding back creativity. Um, so the question basically is how we can use play and gaming and game design in our field to fix these problems. Um, the, the key word really is playfulness and playful activities. So uh, there's an activity that some of our high-profile designers call thinking with your hands, and it involves working around physical materials. So now I've been uh, doing a lot of work with physical materials and phys physical interaction with games and anything else. I've been, uh, for Objects in Space, working on physical controllers that you can use to control the game. And something really interesting happens, because whenever people use their hands, it feels very intuitive, and it's something that people feel they're very natural with, even if the game is very complex. So the way people use this in my field, game designers, uh, we do paper prototyping. So we use something very physical to get across our ideas, to visualize what we're thinking about. So you can prototype almost anything using the materials around us. It's a very human thing to do. Very. Uh, interesting to look at what humans can come up with if you give them the freedom to, you know, play around with their tools around us. Using your hands is very intuitive and a deeply human thing to do. And very interestingly, we start kids out on practicing these tools when they're young. So we give them toys to build towers and whatnot. We give them glue and scissors and paper and uh, all these things to build and uh, test and do things in playful ways. But the older we get, the more uncomfortable we get with using these tools, and the more we think we have to be more professional about it, we talk a lot more, um, which is interesting because 
uh, most people are very visual and most ideas are more easy to get across when you give people something into their hands that they can touch and see and feel. So conveying ideas is a very visual, visual thing. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to hand over an exercise to you guys that you can do with your students that I have very good experiences with in my classrooms and in my career. Um, I tried to combine two things in the next one that I'm going to present to you, which combines uh, playful learning and playful creating with something, uh, a method that is a bit easier and better for brainstorming sessions. So the suggested exercise is about the game Snakes and Letters, a very simple game that you probably all know. So take a bunch of pencils and glue and paper and other materials you can find and give your students uh, in groups the task to recreate snakes and letters, but with an additional rule that you give them. For example, uh, snakes and letters with cards. It's a fantastic group exercise that um, can be played very easily. There's a playful way to look into this, and it can be iterated on very easily. On top of that, I would suggest when you launch them into this exercise to uh, to use a method that is a bit more inclusive than brainstorming, because brainstorming as um, a method is not a very inclusive way of including voices that are maybe not as confident, but still people having good ideas. So instead I would do something called brain writing. Brain writing is a similar exercise, except that um, people from all kinds of different backgrounds get a voice. So everyone gets a piece of paper, and same way as in brainstorming, you get people to write down their ideas and there are no wrong ideas. except. Um, that after one minute of silent writing, no talking allowed, the, hand, the paper gets handed to the next person and the next person can either write down another idea on that piece of paper or something related to the first idea and so on. And people can s silently and with time write down what they're thinking about without the fear of peer pressure. In the end, you still have to sit down and discuss. Um, but yeah, I've, I've noticed that this method is better for groups to interact um, and be more inclusive with each other. In combination with going back to Snakes and Letters, you, that's a fantastic exercise to get people started on playful creative thinking, and uh, that's what I would like to send you away with. <laughs> I think Neil's yeah. back, but there's no I sound. am. I'm back. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jenny. That was fantastic. So our next session is on programming. Um, Conan Burke is going to be our speaker. Conan's the, the head of um, the programming um, faculty at AIE. Conan comes from um, many years experience developing games for a range of platforms, so quite a few games that you, you may have actually played um, potentially in your misspent youth. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Conan and, uh, and Conan's going to fill us in on some really cool programming ways of programming but programmers can collaborate. Cool. So, um, hi everyone. Hopefully, everything's all clear and people can see me. Um, so, my name's Conan. I'm the head of programming here for AIE. Uh, before joining AIE, I used to work on a whole bunch of different games, mostly for kids using uh, PS2 and Wii. So, a bunch of different games involving cartoon characters, mostly uh, SpongeBob and various other superheroes and things. Uh, so there's always lots of fun making games. As a programmer, it's more technical than most of the other fields in game development, so it can be quite challenging. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a few different things uh, that might help you in your group work. It's, it's going to be a little difficult because I know you're all from sort of different year levels, uh, you're using different software, but there are some uh, tips that apply to all programming fields. I'll just switch on over to my slides. And there. Hopefully it's all uh, good to go now. So, like Neil mentioned, uh, coding for collaboration sort of where we're going with here. Coding is uh, a very much a team effort, uh, and lots of different challenges can arise. So, like I mentioned, the challenges you're going to face will be different depending on the software you use. But in uh, game development as a programmer, there's typically sort of two ways to look at programming. You're looking at games that uh, wait for certain things to happen. They wait for events to happen. You know, this is uh, if you're using Scratch, then you're looking at things where uh, waiting for a button to be pressed, what's going to happen next? So you've got to plan out 
what are the things we're waiting for? What are we what do we want to happen in our game? So if a player presses forward, well, you want something to move forward, so you need to plan that type of thing. But that's not how all games need to work. Some games instead work off the idea that it's just a constant loop that's happening. Uh, most games that are programmed on a PlayStation, for example, you just have this constant loop where you have to constantly move something, draw something, move something, draw something. And it's not so much a system where it's waiting for something to happen. There's always something going on. So it com adds this whole new challenge to how you think. Uh, in the case of Scratch, well, maybe you've got to, while the game's playing, forever move things around a screen. Maybe you want a ball to constantly be bouncing. Maybe you want an event system tied into something that also updates over time. You have problems of, okay, I press a button, I want the little player spaceship to shoot a little laser beam across the screen. Well, the spaceship's waiting for something to happen, and that's the event of I press something, but now you've got the problem of, okay, I've created a laser. Now the laser has to have its life of its own and fly across the screen. But if all it did was just move forever, then it's going to go off the screen, disappear off into space, but that laser beam still exists. So as a game programmer, you have to figure out, okay, when do I want things to happen, but when do I want things to stop? And it just has this whole new way of thinking that you have to uh, apply to game programming, which comes into like how you solve these problems is very much based on your early plans. Pretty much all problems in game programming, or any programming really, can be solved if you plan really well to begin with. And uh, in schools, it's a great chance to get students together in groups, uh, programmers, artists, designers, anybody who's working in a group together to sit down and plan out what it is they want to make and try and think of all the steps logically, regardless of software and regardless of everything else that's going on, just think what they want to happen in a game. So this is a great chance to get the paper out, draw down ideas, uh, think of, okay, so I want the player, when I press a button, to jump forward, and you plan logically how this is going to happen. For a programmer, that's great, because then when it comes time to actually programming something, you've got a plan down of exactly what it is you want it to make, and you just have to jump on in and start making it. But it works great for designers and artists as well, because now they know everything that's going to happen. They know all the art that they need. They, need, they know uh, sort of how to apply the design of their game to like, what rules you can change in a game. Um, best thing for programmers, once you've got that stage sort of planned out, is to jump into more well, pair programming. Ideally, you would never want to try and have your programmers in a classroom working separately from each other. You want them constantly collaborating together. So having them work together on the same machine, the same computer, looking at the same problems, is ideal because they're going to solve any problem that they instantly see. They've got a, a friend to talk ideas with, uh, bounce some stuff off, you know, bounce ideas off the wall type of thing, rather than just having these programmers all sitting separately working away. So try and avoid really technical programming stuff. Uh, UML is this, for anyone who's never used it, is a thing uh, where it's like a, a technical way of planning what it is you want to do in software development. But what it can do is take away from the fun and the creativity of planning logically what you want to happen in a game. And instead, you're tied to all these rules as to how you must design stuff. Uh, some software teachers are very much stuck in that really technical design sense. But for games, you should get away from that. The focus should entirely be on the game and less on the technical side. So just pen and paper, plan out some ideas, logically what you want to happen in a game, get together work in pairs, and start making that type of stuff. When you're working with artists, uh, they kind of need to know what to make. You don't want to just have someone off to the side drawing some pictures, programmers are making stuff, and then at the end, we have a bunch of pictures, but we don't know where they should go. Ideally, in the plan stage, uh, plan out every little drawing you need, every single character in your game, uh, the pickups they have, bullets they have, what does the background look like, but also probably come up with uh, rules and constraints as to, well, how big are they? So the artist can then go off and start making all these things, but the programmers can start setting up the game to work with just basic little placeholder things, like a little pink box. I've made plenty of games where it's just a bunch of squares running around chasing more squares, because the game works, and I can then slot the art in later on, so you're never delayed by anything. And the same goes with design. If you do that early planning to begin with, 
then you know all the different properties of things that need to change or how you can affect the rule of your game. So you as a programmer can set up all these little options that a designer could come along and tweak little numbers, move some sliders around, move things to different locations. So they can really affect how the game plays while the programmers are then still able to make the rest of it. And this is uh, goes for a program using any kind of software. If you're using Unity 3D, you could set up a game world, set up some basic scripts, let the designers tweak things while the programmers start implementing more things. But if you're using Scratch, same idea. You come up with what are the properties of your game, what are the numbers, the things that can change, and try and set it up so that the designers can tweak that stuff while you, as a programmer, implement other things. Working together can be a challenge, uh, but ideally it just comes down to how you, like what tools you use for you planning your project. Uh, agile project planning is probably the way you want to go. It allows for sort of flexibility and creativity in a group, and it's kind of the idea where you don't have to come up with this huge solid plan, Gantt charts, and all this technical stuff that makes it boring. Instead, you just come up with a list of sort of individual little things you need to do, and you just kind of post-it notes are one of the best ways to do this. You just put it up on a wall, all the different tasks that we need to do. And then you have it sort of a column of things that need to get done, things that we're doing, and things that are done. And visually, as you work through your project, you can see different tasks move through your list, and you can see how far you are off completing your project. And every day, you can get all the group together, have a quick little five-minute chat. Everyone says where they're up to, what they're working on, what they're going to do that day, and then everyone just gets in and does it. If you don't have space for things like post-it notes on walls, you could maybe have cork boards, put post-it notes on that, then put it away in a, a different store, uh, storage room each day, bring it out when the class is running next. Or for some groups that are a little bit more technical savvy, uh, you can use some web versions of this type of thing. Trello is uh, very useful for this. You can have everyone log in with their own account, share tasks around, and sort of move tasks from board to board. Uh, so it's a kind of a virtual version of Post-it Notes. For some groups that are really technical savvy, um, sort of maybe a year 10, 11, 12 groups uh, who are doing actual programming using things like JavaScript, Python, um, maybe they're using, using Visual Basic, Unity, things like that, then you might want to use something like uh, a version control tool, which is something that keeps track of all the changes you make to your code. So it allows you to revert back if there's a problem. Uh, but it also allows people to work together on the exact same file, and you can make changes. So each student can be working separately, but they're working on the exact same thing. Uh, GitHub is a really good open source sort of, well, free, not so much open source, but a free way to do this with lots of code projects you can look through. Dropbox is OK for this type of thing and allows you to store stuff online. However, uh, you can't be editing the same file at the same time as each other, but it does keep track of version history. Ideally, though, you really want to avoid things like using USB sticks for backing up projects, because commonly you'll have students override each other's work, or they'll make a change and it breaks something and they don't have history to go back to. So that's sort of a, a little bit of a rant on different techniques or tips that might help, uh, but that's kind of it for me. Hopefully you have uh, some good times creating projects. Um, and yeah, have fun with it. That's kind of it for me. I'll hand back to Neil. Thanks a lot, Conan. Our next session is actually around game art. Uh, this is a game here that um, has been developed by students. It's actually available for sale on Steam. Um, it's called Berserkers. And what, one of the things they really focused on was getting a unique look and feel to their game. So anytime someone sees a screen, that they can instantly identify it as that particular game. And something they really focused on. So I'm going to hand over to Dean Finnegan, who's our head of game art. Um, and he's going to talk a lot more about how to get your pixels telling the message of your game. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Neil, for that introduction. I'm um, my name's Dean Finnegan. I'm uh, head of uh, game art and animation over at AIE, and um, I've spent roughly about 20 years uh, working 
uh, in the games industry. Uh, seeing quite a lot of changes, as John mentioned earlier, uh, and the games industry is uh, forever changing, forever innovating. Um, even uh, nowadays, work with VR and uh, AR, augmented reality, really coming to the fore. Um, I've worked on some pretty big titles and some uh, pretty small titles, and you can probably tell from my accent, I'm uh, originally from the UK. Um, and I've always been involved with, with art uh, and animation for games. And um, just really reiterating over uh, what Jenny mentioned early on, uh, and ultimately what, what Conan recently mentioned as well. Um, is that making games is definitely a, a collaboration and it's um, a very creative collaboration as well. Um, and often with games, it's uh, a step into the unknown and, and that's the tricky part of, of making games is you're not really sure um, exactly what you're going to make. Uh, a lot of uh, problems may arise along the way um, that you have to problem solve your way through. Um, a lot of early ideas that you thought uh, were fantastic uh, gameplay mechanics really fall flat and they're just not fun at all. So this is something that the game might uh, evolve slightly um, uh, as you are constantly uh, play testing the game and the game's evolving. Um, and one thing that I want to talk about in terms of uh, from an artist's point of view is to really um, uh, get you to encourage your teams that uh, involve artists um, to iterate. Um, often you see uh, the finished product of, of games in the shops and you see all this fantastic artwork, really highly polished, um, lots of fine detail uh, and that's something that uh, a lot of teams become a, a little bit um, kind of um, intimidated by that uh, they've got to make this fantastic artwork right from the word go. Uh, and that's not the case at all. And the, um, the sooner that you can get the teams working as a, a, an iterative approach, um, the more successful those teams will be. Um, and really what that allows the teams to do is very early on, very quickly, um, test ideas and see if they work and if those ideas do work then um, the artwork can be uh, polished um, as um, the game progresses. So what I want to do is um, I'll share my um, screen and let's have a look at uh, kind of some uh, examples. There we go. Okay, so whether the game is uh, a 2D project or whether it's a 3D project, um, the same uh, approach to artwork applies. And, and really the, um, the iteration is all about um, getting artwork in there as early as you possibly can to test things out. Um, Conan mentioned earlier if you're doing a, a game that involves a spaceship, um, don't the team shouldn't be waiting for the artist to spend weeks um, finally painting all the details and the portholes and the, the nuts and bolts and, and the shininess or the rust on the spaceship, only to find that once it goes in game, um, that mechanic doesn't really work and all the artwork has been wasted. And um, believe me, I've spent a lot of time um, working in projects where um, this hasn't happened and a lot of the artwork has gone to waste. So as you can see from, from the slide, this is uh, um, an example of um, possibly a, a 2D approach that your teams might have. Um, and obviously, uh, you don't need to kind of guess which one is the finished artwork. Um, but really, if you look at the, the image on the left, um, let's say, for example, this is um, a background for a game. Um, the team, the programmers, the designers um, shouldn't really be waiting for weeks and weeks for this finished artwork to, to emerge. And um, really, the artist 
um, should mock up those early ideas as a quick sketch, um, still keeping to the right format um, and making sure everything's named correctly. That's another uh, really strong tip for the artists. The artists um, really do need to make sure that they name everything thoroughly. Um, otherwise that can cause havoc within a, a game project. Um, what you can see the image on the left um, can be really knocked up in um, 10 minutes and that can be um, exported, given to the programmers, they can test it in engine. Whatever the engine is, it doesn't really matter. And so um, because you're going through this really rough ideas to test it first, um, not much time is getting wasted by the artist. You're not really looking at detail at this stage. It's just basic shapes, um, roughly where things are on the screen to get that sense of um, is it going to really work. Okay. And um, so let's move on. Um, so that's a 2D. Um, potentially the game could be 3D as well and it might involve characters, it might involve spaceships, backgrounds, props, anything. And this process of iteration really applies to absolutely every part of, of the artwork. And as you can see, this is um, an example of um, uh, student work done at AIE from last year. And you can see that um, the left-hand um, image um, is really the early ideas of that character forming. All it is is very simple shapes, um, really um, kind of mocked up very quickly um, within a space of 20 minutes and that can be exported into Game Engine uh, and really test is the character um, big enough, is the character the right scale and if it isn't um, only 10 minutes was spent working on this quick changes can be made, re-export it um, if it doesn't work. Once um, it seemed to be working and the gameplay um, is fitting, the artwork is fitting to the gameplay, yes, the character is the right size, it feels great, um, then that can be um, start uh, the polishing process um, and uh, going through various stages of polish. Um, again, not waiting for the artist to, to spend three, four weeks um, until the finished artwork emerges, but almost on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, get the artist to um, export um, literally their work in progress so that you can constantly check and evaluate is everything um, going in the right direction. And I think as an artist um, who's absolutely obsessed with artwork and quality artwork and animation, really that collaboration on a game project, the game is the important thing. Um, the artwork is there to, to sort of make the mechanics, um, kind of dress the mechanics up, but really we've all experienced games that look absolutely amazing um, but are, not, are absolutely terrible to play. So really it's all about the game and it's feeding, um, all the art assets are feeding into this thing uh, that's building within the game engine. So that you, the sooner that you can expose um, the work, um, then the, the quicker you can test it. Is it going well? Yes. Um, and carry on. If not, start making your adjustments. Maybe early days you might have to radically rethink your ideas, but if you've gone through that very quick iteration, um, you've not wasted too much time. So you can see, for example, um, the character um, building from very rough shapes into the finished um, character. And um, again, this is an example um, of um, the characters starting to animate. So the animation was put onto the rough character on the left, and that was exported into Game Engine so that um, the programmers, the artists, the designers could see um, was this character the right feel for the game. Um, and compare that with the final animation. You know, very, very similar, similar proportions, um, but not much time was wasted because the early stages uh, were done properly. Okay. Um, once it's working, then you can polish. And I think this is the main key for the artists: is 
to really prevent artists from um, not showing the work until it's absolutely finished. Um, it's quite difficult. Uh, as artists, we often feel like we're, we're sort of bearing our soul and we only want to show only our best work. But for a game, um, this is absolutely not the case. And we have to encourage the artists to, to really expose um, their work at every stage. And as you can see here, this is using um, Unreal Engine. Um, so the left hand is um, the rough character. Uh, let's see if this plays. There we go. And again, this is the character in Unreal. So those early stages uh, allowed the team to check if the character was working, and it, it was, and therefore the character went through um, to the final stage. Uh, and again, this is, this is also true for any 2D as well. Um, so uh, I've seen games, really successful games, develop um, with 2D animation where the 2D animation was tested just with stick figures, uh, and that's absolutely fine. Um, get the stick figures in there with run cycles and walk cycles. Um, check if, if the frames are, are correct, the right number of animations, the scale of the character, how fast the character. These are all the, the kind of gameplay elements that you can check even with a stick figure. And once they're successfully working, um, then you can start hanging and, and polishing and developing the artwork. Um, the artwork doesn't just miraculously happen. Um, you, you know, it's something that the artist has to work on and keep building and adding more and more detail as they go. But all along the way, I think uh, um, it's, it's just testing that work. Um, so really, to, to sum up, um, let's see if this Works. Yep. Um, so the sooner um, you can see the game, the better. Um, it's all about gameplay. Um, art is not the focus. The gameplay is. Okay. Get rough work in to test ideas. It's so much quicker, and not an awful lot of time is wasted. Um, very quick drawings, get them in. Very quick shapes, get those in and test it. Does it work? If yes. Polish it, but still keep testing. And if it doesn't work, rework it. Uh, and again, because the work was initially rough, not an awful lot of time is wasted. And this will hopefully help um, the development of really successful game projects that are really fun uh, and really um, you know great to be involved with. Okay, I'll now um, hand back to Neil. Thanks very much, Dean. That was really fantastic. Our next session is actually um, being run by Dale Ward. Dale's actually the author of this, this particular game. Did all the sound behind it and sound effects. Um, and it's one of those games that I can, I can hear it a long way away and I know exactly which game it is. He's created a whole um, unique feel to the game. Now, that might be a little bit too much for some teams, um, but certainly thinking about how their game sounds and the soundscape of their game and how they can really contribute to the look and feel of the game is, is something that often gets left to the last minute. So I'd like to introduce Dale Ward, who's going to talk about game sound. Hi, guys. Hope that you can see me and everything is good. Uh, my name is Dale Ward, and I'm an online teacher for AIE, and I'm I teach from home, so that's why you can actually see my house behind me, uh, and I'm kind of in my makeshift studio. And um, I've only been in the industry or games industry for I'd say about seven years now, or maybe eight, um, and. Before that, I was a musician, and I've been a musician since I was about 14 years old, so that's about 20, 20 years now. Um, so sound is really important to me, and it's something that I always sort of talk to about my students, but it's not something that we cover, kind of cover at AIE. Uh, we don't have a stream for it, and it's something that does tend to get kind of left uh, particularly by students, uh, to the end of the project, which is a, a little unfortunate because if you think about it, really what you're seeing on screen when you're playing a game 
there's it's about a third of the game experience. So um, you've got your audio, your visuals, and then your gameplay. Um, uh, let, let's say approximately a third of the game. So let's say 30% of your game is an audio experience for, for the majority of games. So if your students go and make a game and they don't actually plan, plan for the audio um, and they kind of leave it to the last moment, it really does kind of suck the fun out of a lot of the, the game. So uh, I guess my advice would be to run a class uh, or a lesson just just briefly and sort of explain to students how important sound is. And you can do that by just using some really sort of simple examples. Uh, things like uh, when Mario picks up a coin, you don't actually need to see the game. Like once you've played the game a few times, you don't need to see the game, you only need to hear that sound. And you know what that sound cue is and you can visualize what's happening. Um, if a lightsaber, for example, is ignited or it clashes, we all basically know what that sounds like. Um, you don't actually need to see that happening. You could just hear that and you know what's happening. So using sound cues is really important. It doesn't necessarily have to be for everything that's happening on the screen. It can just be things like ambient sounds. So you don't need to see a steam pipe. You just need to hear one. Uh, they don't, like the artist doesn't need to make a giant rolling ocean. You can just play the sound of a giant rolling ocean, basically. Um, so who should actually do the sound for these guys, for these students? So there's a surprising amount of talented students out there who have musical ability and uh, we they kind of fly under the radar because we're, we're busy teaching them other things. Um, so, I guess you know, kind of asking. Uh, <laughs> you can you can ask them, but a lot of I find sort of musical students or sound students find it a bit. I don't know. Some do find it a bit difficult to sort of come forward and actually bear their musical soul, so to speak. But if you can kind of get a feel for who's got some experience. Um, and then sort of guiding them uh, and sort of spreading them out through any kind of teams in the that you're forming and then maybe giving, you know, well, not forcing the, the sound design on them but giving them an opportunity to sort of to shine in that area. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of tools that they can, uh, they can use to download and create their own sounds. Um, you guys might even have, uh, say, other musical colleges around you in, like, in the area where you can collaborate. So getting people that actually know what they're doing already can help as well. Um, but I think it's it's not really that hard to generate some sound and some music. Um, I've got some some uh, resource ideas here uh, that I'll just share. So, uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of sites. So there's things like freesounds.org and freesfx.co.uk. There's a thousand um, sites. The, the issue with this is that it's really time consuming to go through and listen to sound effect after sound effect after sound effect. This one's not too bad. It's actually got some... Um, some options that kind of narrow down what you're looking for. There's uh, free sound has a lot of sounds on it. Uh, I can't actually bring that up at the moment because it's down. <laughs> so <laughs> I tried to load it up, but that's uh, their server's down or something. Another issue with doing this is the sound quality is usually pretty bad. So, or it can be, um, it's, it's getting better with free sound and the free sites, but really for good quality sound, you, you do kind of need to go to those paid services. Um, also, you know, if the students don't have a lot of access to the web or it's kind of limited, then, you know, getting this, this sort of stuff is kind of tricky for them. The other thing is that most of the sounds kind of come, uh, they can be not edited very well and you, you need to select a, you know, a certain part of it and grab a part out of it. So 
then they're going to need to learn some sort of audio editing software. Um, something like Audacity, you're probably well aware of, um, which is just, I would say it's a basic audio editing software, but it can be kind of complicated if you've never used anything like that before. Um, and sort of understanding how audio works and looping and uh, like looping audio and that kind of thing can be a bit tricky, but um, I think it's definitely worth, it really only takes about sort of half an hour to kind of sit down and just go through some basic tutorials to learn how to sort of edit you, not your own sounds, but other people's sounds. I mean, you can use it to, to do your own stuff, but if you generate your own stuff, you should be able to have it fairly well edited beforehand. Um, there's also a lot of other things that go with it. So there's like the format type, um, like, you know, what kind of quality type. Game engines like Unity are really good for uh, being able to change that on the fly. So um, sound files are actually quite renowned for taking up a lot of room and a lot of space. So that's something to kind of consider. And then using Unity to kind of crush that quality down a little bit so they're not sort of taking up a lot of bandwidth. Um, so the, I guess uh, getting the students to actually generate their own stuff would be a really good learning experience. Um, so if you, I mean, you can just grab some sounds, you can grab some music. Uh, the, the licensing is a bit of an issue, but if you wanted to go and sort of make your own sounds, um, there's some really good online applications like this one. It's uh, bfxr.net, and it's literally just a like a sound design tool. Um, I can't actually run the audio through because uh, the audio is kind of poor quality when I do that over the over the web. So uh, just take my word for it <laughs> and go and check it out. So you can just sort of twiddle some knobs. Um, and move some sliders and then preview the sound. And it has some presets, so like pickup coin and laser shoot to get you started. And then you can use some of these options to just generate a wave file. And this is more of a kind of a retro sort of thing. Um, so it will sound sort of old school, uh, but that, there's nothing wrong with that. There's some decent sounds that you can get out of this thing. And it's kind of unlimited. You can all, almost create anything out of these few sliders. Um, you just need a bit of time. And the, the learning curve with this sort of thing is virtually nothing, which is awesome. Um, there's a few other tools. So for music, for example, there's a lot of online tools that the, the guys can use um, if they have access to them. Uh, if not, they have downloadable apps that you can download and then give to the students and they can create their own music online. So, uh, for example, Audio Tool. It's an online app where you can just go in and sort of play around and it's got a, a sequencer and uh, it's basically a, a pattern type thing. So it just runs through a tempo and you just put drum beats and synths and stuff where you where you want them to be. Um, doesn't require a lot of musical ability, uh, but if, you know, the student does have some sort of music ability, he'll be able to get something out of it, uh, or she. Um, Audio Source is another really good one. So this is, uh, it's got a bunch of instruments that run on a piano roll. So by clicking on the, on the keys on the side, you can sort of draw out your like where you want your drum beat. So right now I'm using um, the sampler. So this samples like drum kit sounds, and you can sort of uh, just sort of draw in where you want your beats. You can also then switch to say an analog synthesizer, and this is where the guys will get to learn simple things like um, you know low frequency low frequency oscillators, uh, envelopes, a little bit about synthesis. It's, it's like uh, really not a very steep learning curve. It's pretty simple. There's a bunch of sounds that they can dial up and they, they just then draw in the notes that they want and then when they press play, it just kind of plays through the music roll and 
yeah, they create their own music. And the really cool thing is that they can get to it from anywhere uh, online. Um, now, I use uh, a bit of software called Reason, but I also use sort of a, a lot of other stuff. And this is kind of my studio setup, I guess, my home studio setup. Um, and there's a lot of these people out there who are, you know, they're home musicians and they're really just desperate to be able to break into this sort of stuff and a lot of them will give their time uh, up for free. So if you can find those people, um, I'm struggling to find some sort of resource or location where you can track these people down to be quite honest. So um, I might be able to give Neil some further information on that. Uh, but my, my point is getting people that kind of want to break into the games industry that are home musicians um, is also another good way to get like good quality stuff and they'll come along and they'll work for free and they'll just you know supply some music and some sound effects. Um, but you can also use the same sort of uh, apps, don't necessarily need to use the online stuff or use those guys. Uh, there's some mobile apps which are really awesome from Propellerhead. Um, one is called Figure, and I'll sh give you a quick demo of that in a second. And another one is called Take, and it, that's basically you can record things on your phone and then uh, just put it into Figure um, and then make music out of it so you can record basically anything. So it's like a mobile sound recorder. Um, NodeBeat is an, an alternative one which can go on Android and these are more kind of experimental. They don't really require too much musical stuff. You're just going to push some buttons and they make some music and they make some sounds which is kind of cool. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a million resources for this kind of stuff but really just checking the, the licensing is the important part but technically I mean, if the students aren't going to be releasing this commercially and it's just going to be a, you know, an inclusive project that they're keeping to themselves, then, you know, the licensing, you could maybe be a little bit relaxed on that and they can grab whatever they want. Uh, if they are going to put it out into the world and release it, then I'd be very careful with that kind of stuff. And each sound can have its own, or piece of music can have its own um, agreement so it's up to the person who actually put the sound up so that's also a time-consuming thing kind of going through. Um, this is a really complicated business sound design it takes time it's the same as anything else it, it's a skill it requires time dedication you know talent um, so the guys shouldn't really expect great results to begin with. Um, but the best thing about it is it's really quick in terms of experimentation. You push something, you get immediate feedback. You press a key and you get some sound. You dial some knobs and uh, it does, you know, things come out of the speakers. It's, it's really kind of uh, instant gratification you get on this thing. Um, so to give you just a very quick uh, demo of this app I've got here, uh, it's called um, Figure, and it was the one I was showing you before from Pro Propeller Heads. And you, any of the guys can download it on their uh, mobile phones, and you can just record, say, things like drums, and then... Um, I'm not doing very well, so <laughs> it has um, drums and synthesizers, um, and the synthesizers don't even have keys. You literally just press like a space on a screen, and you just move your thumb around. You probably can't see that; it's all whited out. But you just move your thumb around, and it just makes like music. And it's something that I use in the doctor's office, or if I'm waiting for a movie to start or something. Uh, the guys can download that; that's free off the App Store. Um, and it makes music instantaneously. You can have something up and running in about five minutes and they can just plug an audio lead into their PC and record it. So, yeah, that's I hand back over to Neil. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Um, 
So that's our final session for Power Hour. We, we just fit it into the hour, which is fantastic. Um, Dale had me, had me almost running for the, uh, <laughs> the mute switch, but he made it, which is fantastic. Um, we've, we've also, I just wanted to butt in there at the end and say, you know, if you have, if you have iPads or iPods or those, any sort of Mac tool, another one to look at is, is GarageBand. And you can do the same sort of thing with your tablets and other devices. GarageBand comes free for any Apple device and very simple. Um, there's some, some maybe not so intuitive as some of the tools Dale was talking about, but it, it is one that a lot of students have started to use and um, certainly can get something very quick, placeholder, and then if you have time to replace it down the track. So um, great one, Dale. Uh, that wraps up the session. Um, the chat room is still running, so if you have questions that maybe who was that speaker, what was that reference, um, feel free to go in the chat room and ask the question. The session has been recorded. It is available to rewatch, um, and and obviously it's a publicly available um, YouTube video, so feel free to share it. Um, after this, we're actually going to be sending an email out um, tomorrow, which is going to be getting some feedback from you, and also giving you the opportunity that if you're in actually interested in AIE, running some sessions either for you as a teacher or for your students or everyone together on a range of different topics. Um, there'll be a link in that email, so have a look out for that. We'll also have it on the website tomorrow as well. So just let us know what sort of sessions you're interested in. And if you're living in near one of our campuses, so we have campuses in Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, Adelaide, um, and we have some, some people also working for our online campuses like Dale um, around the country, there may, we may well be able to organise a visit and, and do some one-on-one -on -one sessions with you. Um, alternatively, we're also running a whole series of online sessions, one per week, in a range of areas, and in partnership with the STEM Games Challenge group. Um, the, the email that Liam sends out, who's the coordinator of the STEM Games Challenge, every week there is a particular topic, depending on sort of roughly where the teams are up to in their development, and, and that live session will relate to that. Um, so, yeah, get in touch. It'll all be on the on the website, so um, look out for that. It'll be in the email as well. And as I said, thanks for coming. If you have any more questions, check out the chat room. The link's there. And um, see you later.